Today is our first day back, our first Sunday back with our kids. So we're going to, our kids, third grade and under, you can go downstairs and your, your teacher, I want to thank really Rachel and Kristen for kind of coordinating all these things. So third grade and under, you can go downstairs, okay? Uh, and if you would, please, uh, we're going to... Uh, we're going to have you turn over, if you want, over to Exodus chapter 19. <laughs> yeah, come on, Mama. Come on, Mama. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, and, and I don't know, maybe if you weren't contacted, but you'd like to be part of, we have actually the, the little lambs and then the, then the other, I, don't, I forget what the group, the, other, the older group is. But if you'd like to be a part of that and help, you know what we found out is the more people that help, the less times you have to go in there, okay? And so, you know, you don't have to be a parent to go down there. Uh, in fact, maybe sometimes it's nicer when the parents don't have to go down there, okay? But anyway, uh, this morning what I want to do is I want to spend the next couple of weeks at least on, this, on David. I think David is one of the most interesting characters in the Bible. You know, I look back on, there's a couple guys, I mean, I'll be happy to meet them all when I get to heaven. But there's a couple guys I really want to meet. I want to meet David because he was extraordinary, okay? We're going to talk about his life. The other guy I really want to get to know is Jonathan, his best friend, okay? And then the other guy I really, really like is Joshua. Why do I like Joshua so much? Because Joshua played second fiddle for 40 years before he got to be first fiddle in the band, so to speak. And he never complained about anything. How many people do you know that are willing to play second fiddle for 40 years to get their chance? Very few. So it tells me that Joshua had a servant's heart. Why I love Jonathan, because Jonathan knew his best friend was going to take his position as, position as king. And he still was his best friend. So those are three characters I really want to get to know, okay? But, you know, so I want to talk about David, the king of Israel. But before we turn to David, we have to turn a few pages back. In time and see how we got to the place that David becomes king of Israel. I, I, you know, I like history a lot, and so I like to find out the history behind all these things. So today, especially, and we might not get through it all today, which is fine, because I always have next week, okay? But I want to talk about how David became king of Israel. In Exodus chapter 19, okay, God chose Moses to be the deliverer. And he chose Moses to lead the children of Israel out of bondage to worship him in the desert. And once the children of Israel as a nation got into the desert, God planned to make the entire nation of Israel a kingdom of priests. Now think about this. We're going to, over in Exodus chapter 19 verse 6. And it says, this is the Lord speaking. He says, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So what we're finding out here, God's initial plan was, he, was not, he did not necessarily set apart just to have a tribe of priests, the tribe of Levi. He wanted the whole nation to be a priest unto him. So as they're going out into the wilderness and they come to Mount Sinai, we, we, if you read the story, lightning is going on, thundering is going on, you know. And as Moses was summoned to Mount Sinai, the people experienced thunder and lightning flashes, sounds of the shofar or the trumpet, and the mountain shaking, and fear and trembling came upon them. Now, I'm not going to make fun of these guys. Because if I was by a mountain, and all of a sudden all the lightning uh, took off, all the flashes, all the thunder, and the earth started shaking, I don't know if I'd want to go up the mountain either, hallelujah, okay? So I'm not going to, I'm not going to really give these guys a hard time, okay? But look what it says in Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 through 21. Exodus 20, 18 through 21. Now all the people witnessed the thundering, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak to us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you that, that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. Really what, see, God chose you and I to hear God for ourselves. Come on. 
See, there are some groups that they think you have to go to the priest or to the pastor or somebody to hear from God. No, folks, that's not God's best. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? God said he wants you. See, the children of Israel said, Moses, you go and talk to God for us and then we'll listen to you. Well, I don't know about you, but I remember, I'm, I'm old. Remember Truth or Consequences, the show? I remember watching that show and they would tell somebody a secret. And then they would pass it on, they'd pass it on. And generally, by the time it got to the fourth or fifth person, it was nothing like the original person said. And you know what? So I'm not trying to tell you people are trying to deceive you. I don't think they are. A good pastor is not. But you know what? He might not always get it right. Do you understand? And so you and I have to be able to go to God for ourselves also. That was God's original plan. For you and I to be able to hear his voice within our lives for ourselves. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with talking to people what's going on to make sure that that bears witness with the scripture so you and I aren't led astray. But you know what? The children of Israel said, no, we don't want to do this. We want one person to speak for us. So for the next 400 years, Israel was ruled by judges. Men and women who God raised up in a time of crisis to bring deliverance to Israel. Some of them were Gideon, Samson, Deborah, and the last judge was Samuel. This covers the book of Judges and through 1 Samuel chapter 8. It was during this time there was a balance of leadership in Israel. For spiritual leadership, Israel looked to the priest, okay, drawn from the tribe of Levi. And for civil jurisdictions, they would look to the judges. So there was a balance here, okay? And so what we're finding out in Judges, look at Judges chapter 21, verse 25. Now I'm giving you all this background so you'll know how David became king. But in Judges chapter 21, uh, verse 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. See, there's not a king yet. But everyone did what was right in his own eyes. What made this worse was that leaders were doing what was right in their own eyes. Okay? And so what we're finding out, with, since there wasn't a king, and you know what, folks? Who is our king? Come on. King Jesus. We all should have a king. His name is Jesus. Okay? And we need to realize, see, if we know there's a king, we won't be doing things that are only right in our own eyes. We're going to be doing things that are right in our king's eyes. Okay? And I want us to turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 8, we're going to read the first three verses, okay? And we're going to find out, see, Samuel was the last judge, but see, this was not God's best. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways... <clears throat> They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. See, folks, and if you look in these first three verses of 1 Samuel 8, this is what destroys families. This is what destroys companies. This is what destroys churches. This is what destroys lives. Having no regard for the laws of God. As we will see, our position, our position never releases us from our responsibilities. I can say that again. Our position never releases us from our responsibility. And we need to make sure we're doing things according to God's word. Amen? Very, very important. Now I want to say, we're going to read verses, there'll be verses 4 through 22 in 1 Samuel. It says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And said to him, look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us. Look at what, what's it say? Like all the other nations. You know what? I've read my Bible. The Bible says that God has called us in 1 Peter. It talks about you're a royal, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, people set apart from God. Isn't it amazing? Isn't this how we have it in life? God is wanting to set us apart, and we want to be like everybody else. We want to be like everybody else. You know, I, I admired, last week I read an article, there was a gal, uh, she was a seven-day Adventist in the state of Washington. 
and she was an undefeated tennis player, and she made the state tournament. And uh, and uh, and the Wisconsin or the Washington High School Athletic Association said we're playing the tournament on Saturday. If you don't play, you forfeit. She took them to court and beat them. Hallelujah. She said, "My faith tells me I'm honoring God on this day, and I'm not playing." I think we should do more of that. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. Amen. Instead of just making Sunday like another Saturday. Hallelujah. Why don't we say no? The, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. This is for God. Amen. I love it that she won. And the, and the Washington State High School Athletic Association had to play the tournament on a Monday. I don't even care if the girl won the meet. I was glad her and her family stood up for what they believed in. See, God says we're not supposed to be like everybody else. Amen. Come on now. This is pretty good up here, okay? <laughs> we're not supposed to be like everybody else. We are a peculiar people. We have been set apart from this world. That's what the word sanctification means. Set apart unto God. But isn't it amazing? The leader said, we want to be like everybody else. And it says in verse 6, But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. You know what? That's what happens in life. You know, leadership isn't easy. But I tell you what, sometimes, you know, when you're disappointed, don't strike back at people. Pray. Amen. And look, look, this is amazing. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you. This is, this is, I think God's heart broke. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. This is God speaking. That I should not reign over them. You know what we have to always make sure in life too? Especially maybe as a leader, as a pastor. If maybe somebody doesn't agree with me and, and I feel like this is what we need to do. I always have to remind myself, Jeff, this isn't about you. You understand? Isn't it amazing if we try to make it about ourselves, then it gets personal. And when it gets personal, then we get a little stinky, don't we? Hallelujah. Come on. I don't know about you, but I do. And God was telling Samuel, Samuel, this is not about you. They've not rejected you. They've rejected me. The rule and reign. And see, once again, I'm not too harsh on these guys. I want to learn. The Bible says this was written so we could learn. And so we need to make sure that when we don't follow God's word, you know what, folks, what we're really saying is, God, we don't want you to rule and reign over us. And one thing I know about Jesus, he wants the best for all of us. I tell you what, God doesn't have a bone in his body, if he had a body, that has any ill will towards you and me. When he sets his word out here for us, folks, you know why it is? Because he wants to bless us. He wants our life. But you know what? How many times have I been in income poop? How many times I have been like the children of Israel? God, not your will, but my will. Give me a king to rule over me. And God says, Jeff, that's not what you need. Let's keep going. According to all the works which they have done since that day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day which, which, they, which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are, uh, I say they are doing, to this you all, doing this to you also. Now therefore heed the voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will rule over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. Now isn't this amazing? Samuel says, okay, I'm going to tell you what a king's going to do for you. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who, who, king who reigns over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties, will set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and some to take his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. So he says he's going to take your kids and make them do work for him. Then he says, and he will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves and give them to his servants. Isn't this great? And you want a king. Yeah. Uh, and he says, he will take a tenth of your grain of your vintage and give it, uh, uh, and will give it to your officers and servants. And he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, and your donkeys and put them in his work. Give me a king. I want to be like everybody else. Hallelujah. Aren't these guys silly? Come on. Yet how many times have I said, God, I can do it my way? And that's really what's happening in life. Okay? 
He will take the tenth of your sheep and you will be a servant. And you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. And the Lord will not hear you in this day. Nevertheless, in this great, nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but we will have a king over us. I tell you what, if this isn't ignorance gone to seed, hallelujah. Can you imagine? They're telling you this is what's going to happen in your life. It's not going to be as good, da 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 They're saying, bring it on. I want it anyway. Isn't that crazy? And it says, uh, it says in verse 20, I have it underlined my Bible. They said, no, we, but we will have a king over us that we may be like all the nations. See, they forgot. God called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, God doesn't want us. Have you ever felt like you don't fit in sometimes? That's good. Do you understand? That's not bad. That's good if you don't fit into all these situations in life. Because you know what? You know what? The sign of Christianity has never been a chameleon. See, we're not supposed to fit in with everybody. I tell you what, folks, like somebody told me, they were the light. They, somebody saw a difference in their lives. You are the salt of the earth. Do you understand? A light, you're, you're, you and I are going to walk in the dark places. But God says, you're not going to be filled with darkness. You are the light. You don't fit in. You conduct business differently than the rest of the world. You've heard me talk about before. I, I, I just think it's amazing how Chick-fil-A, how Hobby Lobby... Uh, here and locally, how fairway, none of those places are open on Sundays. And they seem to be doing really well. You know why? Because the Bible says you work six days and you rest the seventh. They have actually taken it. You know, the Bible actually says it's amazing. You know, God, Israel was about agriculture. Because what they said on the seventh year was, was a year of, of, of rest, okay, a Sabbath year, Shabbat. And so every seventh year, you know what God told them to do? They weren't supposed to plant anything in their field. They were supposed to let the earth rest. And then after the, on the 49th year, they were supposed to let the earth rest. And then the 50th year was the year of Jubilee. They were supposed to let the earth rest. So for two years, the ground laid rest so it could rejuvenate itself. You know what? We think we're so smart down at Nebraska and Iowa State. How we tell them, well, we're going to... God knew about letting the ground rest a long time ago. Hallelujah. He knew about tra- uh, rotating crops and all those things. Who invented all this stuff? The creator of the universe. Yeah. We're only about 2,000 years behind. Hallelujah. Yeah. And God did all these things. Amen. It's very, very important. And then it goes down and says, That we may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. Look at what this. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, every man go to his own city. What kind of lesson can we learn from this passage of Scripture? There will always be people that we love and we honor, okay, and respect, but nobody can ever take the place of God. This, the prophet or the, the uh, judges were loved and honored and they should have been. But see, God saying no one can take his place. Remember when they said, give me a king, God says, they're rejecting him. So remember that. Love and honor, show respect to people, but nobody ever gets the place, to take the place of God. You've heard me say many times, who gets a 10? Jesus. Jesus, God. Everybody else gets a 9. Nobody else gets a 10 but Jesus, okay? And it's very, very important. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, because God wants to speak to all of our hearts. It says in Romans 8, 14, for as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. See, please don't take this wrong, because I'm not telling you that loyalty and faithfulness and love for others is misguided. It is not. What am I telling you is that all these wonderful characteristics are supposed to be placed in God before man. Okay? God before man. From 1 Samuel, we see the people of God didn't want to be special anymore. What makes you special today? You know what I think makes you special? You decide to get up on a Sunday morning and come to church. I tell you that right now, that's what makes you special for some people. Because there's a lot of people that might even call Jesus Lord. They don't want to be special. 
They don't want to get up on a Sunday morning. They don't want to come to the house of God. I read my Bible when it said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go in the house of God. It didn't say, I was sad when they said unto me, let us go in the house of God. David said, I, I wish I could dwell in the courts of the Lord forever. I tell you what, folks, see, we're special. We should want to come together. I want to see your faces. I heard your beautiful voices in my ears. If I would have stayed home, I could have never been blessed like that. Thank you for that. Amen. I might keep preaching hard. Hallelujah. You okay? <laughs> See, we are special. Yes. Yes. We Turn to your neighbor and say, you're special. <laughs> you are special. You are special, saints of God. Thank you, Jesus. See, for too long we wanted to be like the rest of the world. But you and I are special. Yes. You know why? Because God wants to make us a kingdom, a priest unto himself. See, too many people of God's people don't want to be special anymore. They want to be like everyone else. What Israel has done in a nation, a great majority of individuals have done to themselves. We insist on having our own way and not God's way. So now we're coming up through Samuel, okay? So now the first king we're going to find out before we get to King David, thinking, my Lord, he isn't even at David yet? Nope. There, there's a lot going on here, hallelujah, Okay. The next, the first king was Saul. The first king was King Saul. Now, it's kind of interesting, because if you don't know your Bible real good, I understand. There's two really big, I mean, there's a lot of names in the Bible. You know, I found out at Tech, the last Tech, that Jemima is a biblical name. <laughs> did you know, did anybody else know that? The, a girl got up, uh, who was giving a speech at Tech. She said, my name is Jemima, and I was not named after the syrup. You know? And I thought she probably was. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> and then she said, and I did not know this. I went and I looked. And when I got home, in the book of Job at the very end, Job had a daughter named Jemima. Okay. So I learned that. Her name is Jemima. Okay. But so there's two saws. We have King Saul in the Old Testament. And we have the apostle Paul, who before he met Jesus, name was Saul. So we have two saws in the Bible, two different individuals. Okay. But what we have here is, so now Samuel's getting old. They want a king. So all of a sudden they come to Samuel and say, appoint us a king. So we're going to find out. We're going to go down in verse nine, or chapter 9, verse 1. It says in 1 Samuel, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zizor, the son of whoever, the son of whoever, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. It's kind of interesting. That word power there in the Hebrew means wealth. What we're finding out that the next king of Israel, you know what he had? He had riches, he was handsome, and he was tall. And you know what's kind of amazing? The children of Israel were going to pick a king like the world picked a king. You know, Saul tells us, the Bible tells us that he was ahead at least above everybody else. So they looked at him, number one, they thought, man, he's rich. So you know what? He, he knows what to do with money. He's tall, okay? So we know he's probably powerful. And then, and you know what else they said? And he's also handsome. You know, you don't want an ugly king. You know, you don't want an ugly picture on your dollar bill. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you know what's amazing? So they end up choosing Saul to be king. All on outward appearances. When we're going to get to David, it was a funny, because it tells us that David was a little scrawny kid. He's a ruddy kid. And they were never going to pick him. And then we know the verse that says, and God says, you may look on the outside appearance, but I look at the heart. Amen. Amen. And so we need to realize that. But so what, when Saul first met Samuel, he was concerned about donkeys. What had happened was Saul's dad, Kish, had lost the donkeys. And so Saul, uh, Kish told his son Saul and his servant to go and look for the donkeys. So Saul and his servant are out looking on the hillsides of, of Bethlehem and, and Ephraim. And all of a sudden, they don't know where the dad's donkeys are. And so they think, you know what? They said, they looked for a couple of days. And they said, isn't there a prophet around here? And they said, yes, there is. So they went into town and they found Samuel there. And Samuel said, you know what, Saul? You're concerned about your donkeys. I want you to know, your donkeys are safe, but God has something bigger for you than finding your father's donkeys. Okay? And you know what we find out, Saul? Saul was more concerned about finding his dad's donkeys than the sacrifices. See, too often our donkeys 
Our own pursuits, our own passions, our own pleasures, our own possessions, our own pride are much more important to us than anything else that God wants for us. Come on, now this is good. You can't say amen and say ouch. Come on. Too many times, okay? Samuel told Saul, don't worry about the donkeys. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't worry about the donkeys. Don't worry about the donkeys. You know, the donkeys will get all of our attention, and that's not what's the most important thing in life. The sacrifices, the spiritual things in life, okay? And you know what, folks? You know what God was telling us in Matthew 6, is basically the New Testament version of don't worry about the donkeys. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, which the Gentiles seek after. See, God says, don't get concerned about the donkeys in life. He'll take care of you. One of my favorite verses in Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Don't worry about the donkeys. After a short period of time, God tells Samuel to heed their voices and to make him king. What a heartbreaking day that must have been for God. The very people he had provided for, the very people he had protected from their enemies and visited them with his very presence. They say, that's not enough. I believe, they're basically telling God, I believe someone inferior to you can take better care than us of us than you can as, as a king. That's what they're saying, saints. They're telling God, we think a human being who is sinful can take better care than of, of us than you can, a king of the universe who knows no sin. Now, you know what? I think I'm going to give you a lot to think about this week. Hallelujah, okay? I think Donnie might be getting uncomfortable already. He's already shuffling. Hallelujah, okay? I'm teasing him, okay? See, what can we learn from this? What can we learn from this so far? Be careful what you pray for. Amen. Come on. Be careful what you pray for. Because you know what? God may give it to you. And then when he gives it to you, you might be in a heap of trouble. The nation of Israel prayed, give us a king. God said, no, you don't want to give us a king. God says, no, all these things are going to happen. Give us a king. So God says, I'll give you a king. Be careful what you pray for, okay? King Saul leads Israel to several victories. And then he goes from a timid young man who ran and hid from being anointed king to thinking that he was the king and he could do what he wanted when he wanted. We must all, I believe this with all my heart, we must also be, we must all be careful with success because that will inflate our egos much faster than any defeat we ever experience. Have you ever done something good and you think, that was me? Austin, you scored a touchdown last Monday, didn't you? Didn't you? What'd you think when you got in the end zone? That's me, baby. Did you think that? Well, don't think too much of that. There was, there was 10 other guys blocking for you, buddy. Okay, hallelujah, okay? Okay. <laughs> Giving Austin a hard time, okay? But you know what? Success can do us more damage. And you know what? Saul went from a timid guy who didn't want to be king to said, I can't do this. In fact, he said, I'm from the, one of the weakest tribes. I don't need this to think, and now he was somebody. Okay? See, we must come to the realization that it was the strength of God's devotion to his people that was working through an earthly vessel that delivered Israel from the oppression of her enemies, not the smarts of man. You know, I think of first, uh, second Chronicles, second Chronic, uh, Chronicles, uh, second Chron- uh, not Chronicles, Corinthians, okay? I have both those in my brain. Second Chronicles 4, uh, second Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be a God and not us. You've heard me say this several times. What we have is not because we're so smart. There's people smarter than you that have less. It's not because you and I work so hard because there's people that worked harder than us that have less. See, it's not our own little schemings and devices. I'm not saying that in a bad way. Do you understand? But we just weren't so smart. You know, I, I talked to a friend of mine, David, back in Bullhead City, and him and his wife, they retired Great pensions, 33 years from AT&T, won 33 years from the post office, had great pensions, they had a lot of money they invested, and they just happened to hit it when the stock market went up. And, and he told me, he said, Jeff, I mean, they've been retired now for 22, 23 years, 
and they're living life high on the hog yet. And he told me once, he said, Jeff, it wasn't because we were so smart. We just happened to invest our money in a time where the market went up and we were blessed. And you know, I think that's one reason why God uses them. And they're very big givers all the time, the different things. Because they didn't say, man, it was because I was so smart, I got all this. See, and let's go down to 1 Samuel chapter 13. We're pretty close there. 1 Samuel 13. And because Saul thought got too big for his pants, basically, and, and, he was, and Samuel told Saul they were getting ready to fight, and Samuel told Saul, wait till I come there and I'll offer sacrifices. Because, see, the king was not, resp- was not responsible for the sacrifices. The priest was, the, uh, the judges. And he said, I will come on seven days, and, and when I come on the seventh day, I'll offer sacrifice. Well, it tells us they were waiting there, and in six days, Samuel not showed up, and the people were starting to get a little nervous. And so Sam, uh, Saul said, you know what, I'll offer sacrifices. And it tells us that it's, eh, I've been here before, saints. As soon as Saul offered the sacrifice, because he didn't think Samuel was coming, guess who comes up over the hill? Samuel. Samuel. Have you ever screwed up your timing? I have. You know, I thought, you know, I'm giving God a chance. I'm giving God a chance, but it's getting really close, and I better do something about it. Am I the only one I'm talking to? Hallelujah. We've all been there, haven't we? And because, this wasn't the first time with Saul. But so he offered the sacrifice. And then Samuel comes to Saul and says, hey, what are you doing? And Saul tried to put a good twist on it. Thank God none of us ever do that. <laughs> when I've done something bad, I don't come out and say, it's my fault. No, you know, I wanted to do this, but you know, God, you were a little late. Or you know what, honey, you were a little late. Do you understand? And because God had put up with this for so long, all of a sudden it tells us in 1 Samuel 13, Samuel says to Saul, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. After overstepping his kingly authority and disobeying God's word on numerous occasions, God sends Samuel to King Saul and tells him his kingdom is finished, even though it took approximately 15 years for it to collapse in the physical realm. Look what it says in 1 Samuel 16, 1. I'm still going to get to David. Maybe not today. Hallelujah. Okay. It says, now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. This was a low point not only for Israel, but for also Samuel. Samuel had treated Saul like his own son. His own sons didn't serve God. Now his king had rejected God. Wow. But you know what God was also telling Samuel? Hey, buddy, get up. It's time. The morning is over. Have, I don't know about you. Have you ever had a pity party? And you didn't want nobody breaking up your party? Well, you know what God is basically telling Samuel? Samuel, you've had your chance to mourn. Now it's time to get up and let's find a king that's after my heart. Amen. Come on. Yep. Amen. That's what he's telling us. That's what he's telling us. And you know what? See, the devil, the, the devil would like for us to sit in our pity party and say, woe is me. You know, I've invested everything into this church, and look what they did to me. Look at what the church did to me as a prisoner. All these things. You know what? I'm not trying to diminish the real hurts. Don't you think Samuel was crushed? His own boys didn't follow God. Now his king didn't follow God. He was crushed. But God said, you know what, Samuel, if you're going to stay in that condition, you're never going to get any better. Now it's time because my future is brighter for you. And you know what, folks, it's hard, isn't it? When your present is dark, it's hard to think that your future is brighter. But you know what God's saying? It's going to get brighter. It's going to get brighter. You might have suffered some some hurts. You might have suffered some defeats in the past. But I got a man. I got a person for you. God's not going to leave you in that state. But we got to get up. It says in Ephesians chapter 6, And when you've done all, keep on standing. 
I don't know about you. I have said, there's been times I wanted to sit down and cry. And God says, you're not getting anywhere sitting down and crying, Jeff. You got to stand up. And the Bible says in Ephesians, and when you and I have done all, keep on standing. Amen. But it's hard. Yes, it is. But you know what? Staying down in the muck and the mire is even harder. Because I tell you what, folks, I got a future in front of me, baby. Okay, I got Jesus if he's for me. I got, you know, folks, it doesn't matter how many times we get knocked down. It doesn't matter as long as we get up at least one more time. I see my old rodeo friend here, Donnie. I tell you what, it doesn't matter how many times that horse bucks you off. You got to get back in the saddle, don't you? Come on now, you know. You got to get back in the saddle. Because if you don't, that'll keep you in fear all your life. And God says, you know what? I have, I'm looking for somebody who has a heart after me. Thank you, Jesus. Over in Revelation, then we're probably going to, you know, I'm, golly, I'm, I'm about done here. But uh, I mean, I can mention David's word. David, I mentioned his name, hallelujah, okay? Okay? But I'm, I'm giving you all this so you'll know when we say, that God anointed David, king of Israel. Now you're going to have a lot of history behind what took place. Because remember we said when God took the kingdom away from Saul, it took approximately 15 years for that kingdom, his, his, his reign, to collapse physically. I got some people, they have a hard time waiting on God for 15 minutes. <laughs> Come on, God, you made me a promise. David had to wait 15 years from when he was anointed king to become king. He wouldn't have made it in our culture, would he? No. no. They had attention at deficit disorders. They couldn't have made it. Hallelujah. Okay. Oh, I can't do this. I've always reminded myself, Jeff, a delay is never a denial. A delay is never. Don't you think David had to think sometimes, oh, maybe that really wasn't supposed to be me. You know what? Can you imagine how much fun it was? You know, David had some brothers that didn't think much of him. Do you understand what I'm saying? He was a little ruddy guy on the backside of the mountain keeping a hold of sheep. And all of a sudden, can't you imagine? Remember when, when Samuel comes into, into Bethlehem and, and he tells the Jesse, he says, Hey, I've come to appoint a king and, you're, and where are all your sons? And he goes through all the sons. And then I'm, God's spirit doesn't speak to Samuel's heart. And he says, Do you got another one? And, and Jesse says, oh, I got some little ruddy kid in the back. He's nothing. Oh, isn't that a great thing to think about your parents? Oh, they think I'm just a little ruddy kid. But you know what? Can you imagine when he comes? Uh, can you imagine this? You know, the ba- who's here the baby of the family besides me? I was the baby of the family. Yep. And you know what? You know, you get picked on by your big brothers and sisters and all these things. You know what it's all about? Can you imagine? So here comes David. They don't think much of him anyway. And Samuel says, this is the boy. And he anoints his head with oil. And he prophesies basically over and says, you're going to be the next king of Israel. Can you imagine? Did you hear that voice? (laughs) Did you hear that voice? Well, I'm going to be the next king of Israel. But for the next 15 years, we're going to find out David ran for his life. He had to hide in the desert. Now, you might think, what's the big deal hiding in the desert? Anybody here, who's ever been to Arizona? Raise your hand. New Mexico. It's, it's not fun. Hallelujah. Okay? He had to hide in the deserts and all that and, uh, and to get away from that for 15 years. So what am I going to tell you today? I want to encourage you. Maybe God's given you a promise, but you haven't seen it come to fruition yet. Don't give up. Don't. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't give up. Don't, remember, a delay is not a denial. Don't give up. God gave you that dream. God gave you that vision. And, and you know what? You might have to work through a lot of things in life, but God is for us, not against us. Over in Revelation chapter 5, and then we're going to stop, verses 9 and 10. And it says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal, and for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, have made us what? Kings, Kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on this earth. The Spirit of Almighty God calls each of us away from a self-centered and self-serving 
preoccupations to be like his son who was, who was rejected of God at the beginning. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? To becoming the, the king of the universe. Folks, we're coming back again. After Jesus takes us up, we're going to come back and we get to rule and reign as kings over the new heaven and the new earth. I don't know if that excites you, but it should be. Hallelujah. Yeah. You know, I, I jokingly tell people all the time, and I really do. I collect money. I have money from probably 30, 40 different countries in the world. Most of it is totally worthless. Okay, you know what I'm saying? People say, why do you collect money? And I told them, half jokingly, I said, you know why I collect money? Because when I come back and rule and reign for Jesus, wherever country he puts me, I want to have a little spending cash. Hallelujah, okay? I want to have a little spending cash wherever he puts me. Hallelujah, okay? But you know, we're, God says he's making us kings. He's making us kings. We didn't have the worship team come up. But he's making us kings and priests unto himself. I want you to know it. Why don't we stand up? Hallelujah. We're going to get the, really into David's life. See, we just got the saw. We're going to get into David's life next week. But I want you to know that you're somebody. Yes. You're somebody. Yes. And the devil knows that. And he's going to try to keep you from your destiny with God. But you know what? And you might have to maybe suffer some things. But I want you to know that delay is not a denial. I tell you what, keep pressing on. I, you know, the Bible says, don't grow weary in your well-doing. Amen. That's a hard thing for us to forget. I don't know about you, but, you know, I like to do something to get the results right away. And, you know, you, but you know what? Sometimes it's just a constant, you know, when you pound against something, it maybe doesn't fall apart right away, but you keep pounding against it. And you keep pounding against it. You know, Meryl and I, we put up a little retaining wall. And, you know, I've watched some retaining walls, and, and they're curved a little bit like they shouldn't. Well, you know, it just didn't happen that way. But you know what? That constant pressure against that wall kept pushing it out. And it didn't happen overnight. Maybe it happened over years. But you know what? That constant pressure. And maybe you don't have what that dream is. But I want you to know, keep putting pressure. Keep putting pressure because that wall is going to come tumbling down someday. That wall is going to come tumbling down someday. And you're going to experience what Jesus has for you. You think, how can you be so confident? Because God's word doesn't return void. Amen. I tell you, because God's word is powerful and quicker than any two-edged sword. Amen. Amen. That's our God that we serve. Amen. Amen. I, I want you to bow your heads, please. You know, I'm going to ask you this morning, maybe something a little different. Anybody here this morning that would be willing to raise their hand right where they're at? Say, Pastor Jeff. I thought my delay was a denial. God gave me some dreams in the past and they didn't come to fruition so I just thought they were gone. But after hearing the word of the Lord today I could see that I need to stir up that within me. I need to look to Jesus and exercise my faith again in him knowing that if he made me a promise he is going to keep it in my life. Will there be anybody here no one looking around and say Pastor Jeff would you pray for me right where I'm at? You lift your hand up. Yep. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Lift up your hand in the sanctuary. I tell you what, our God is not here to embarrass anybody. Our God is here to release you and set you free. Hallelujah. Anyone else? I want you to, yeah, unashamedly put your hands up if that's you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you see our hands. Lord, I want to speak a word of encouragement over the folks that raised their hands, Lord. That their delay is not a denial. That, Lord, I pray that those walls that have been keeping their promises, that those walls are going to come, come, come tumbling down, Lord. I thank and I praise you, Lord God, that you have a vision. You have a plan. You have a purpose. And with your presence, Lord God, it's going to come to be in the name of Jesus. The devil is a liar. And Jesus speaks the truth. I pray, Lord God, stir up the gifts that are within these individuals that raise their hands. Lord God, lift up their head. They will look up from whence cometh their help. Their help cometh from the Lord. Let them know that God has not forsaken them. That God is for them, Lord God. I thank you and I praise you for miracles, for breakthroughs that are going to take place in people's lives this week, Lord God. Because we are the salt of the earth and we are the light of this world through Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, for your goodness and your mercy in our lives. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.